श्री पिनाकी मिश्र जी थैंक यू ऑनरेबल चेयरपर्सन फॉर गिविंग मी द ऑपरचुनिटी टू स्पीक ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ माय लीडर श्री नवीन पटनायक जी एंड द बिजू जनता दल ऑन दिस नो कॉन्फिडेंस मोशन दैट हैज बीन ब्रॉट बाय द कांग्रेस पार्टी टुडे मिस चेयरमैन it goes without saying that the foundation of the biju janata dal is anti congressism we were born on the 25th of december 1997 on the basis of opposing the congress party's corrupt rule in odisha at that point of time the late biju patnayak on whose name the biju janata dal is named started his life as a congressman but like many of us got eventually disillusioned with the congress party left the congress party and became a beacon of opposition politics of janata pol politics and that's how the biju janata dal was formed so therefore any motion brought by the congress party goes without saying is out of question for the biju janata dal to support so therefore at the threshold let me make it clear that we oppose this motion because of the fact that it's been brought by the congress party to this house but there are many other compelling reasons and i will tell you tell this house mr chevin about why the biju janata dal feels that this is a misplaced motion totally out of place at this point in time we brought to this house mr navin patnayak is now in his fifth term as chief minister of odisha consecutively he is now the second longest serving chief minister in the country he has just crossed late shri jyoti basu's tenure in west bengal he is now only behind mr pavan chamling in sikkim and next year in august 2024 by the grace of lord jagannath when he is elected for the sixth time as chief minister he will cross mr pavan chamling's tenure and become the longest serving chief minister ever in the history of india and i am very glad to say my heart is gladdened that somebody like shri amit shah ji was in bhubaneswar on saturday in the presence of many of our distinguished colleagues here aprajita sarangi ji was there as well i think our honorable bhubaneswar mp shri shah very graciously said that it is without doubt that mr navin patnayak is india's most popular chief minister these were mr amit shah's own words and he also praised mr patnayak for the cooperative federalism and the constructive cooperation with the center that he has demonstrated in his last 24 years as chief minister he doesn't believe in needlessly picking quarrels with the central government it doesn't pay we are a regional party in the kind of fiscal architecture our constitution has provided it is impossible to continuously bicker and fight with the central government and survive as a model fiscal state as odisha is today particularly if you are needlessly constantly heckling the central government because that doesn't obtain to the interest of the people of the state this is mr patnayak's firm view he believes that yes party politics has its place there is no question and that's why i said the other day when i was speaking on the delhi bill the bjp is our principal opposition party in the state and we fight them tooth and nail when elections are concerned but once elections are over then that should be the end of party politics then governance kicks in and for governance to kick in you have to be you have to rise above partisan party politics and work in partnership with constructive cooperation in a federal structure that's what mr patnayak has always believed in and that's what amit shah ji in fact said that this is the reason that i appreciate mr patnayak's role as chief minister the said i cannot support a no confidence motion against a central government today even though we are against the bjp as a political party but the central government which has may not have given us our entire wish list no central government ever can give every state government's entire wish list i recognize that fact there are fiscal uh, constraints in 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 uh, you know where resources are in short supply and therefore it's not possible for every central government to give up given to every state government demand but in terms of rise in coal production in terms of 
mineral royalty revision which has long been Odisha's just demand in terms of the re removal of an export tax on iron ore and manganese ore which was vital for Odisha's fiscal management. In terms of the other day there was a bill for exploration of offshore minerals which has long been our demand. In terms of in my constituency, a Puri International Airport which has again long been a dream of the people of Puri. Now that is well underway yesterday Mr. Sindhya very kindly said in the house that it is virtually in the last stages of completion of plans and therefore construction should start very soon. In terms of the Puri Heritage, Jagannath Puri Heritage Corridor, which was opposed by some of my distinguished colleagues, I shall not name them, but which the central government ensured the ASI gave permission for it. So I am grateful therefore for many things that the central government has done for Odisha, which is why in any case I am unable to persuade myself on behalf of my party and my leader to support a no-confidence motion today, which has been brought by the Congress party. Let me now come to the merits of this particular no-confidence motion that they have allegedly brought on one count alone, that is to bring the Prime Minister to the House. That seems to be the reason why this no-confidence has been moved, that the Prime Minister should be brought to this House. He is avoiding the House and avoiding speaking on Manipur. Mr. Chairman, I have always believed that the Congress party is adept at snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. They are also very adept at cutting their nose to spite their face. And I say this advisedly. They know every time the Prime Minister has got up to speak on the floor of this House, and I think his worst political adversaries will recognize the fact that he is a peerless orator. There is no question. I don't think there is an there is an orator today in India who matches him. There is no question. Everybody recognizes that fact. So every time he gets up on the floor of the house, he puts the Congress party through the shredder. I mean, they actually go through a shredding machine. So I cannot understand why they should cut their nose to spite their face, ask him to come to the house and put them through the shredder, as I have no doubt he will when he replies on Thursday. So. This defies common sense, it defies logic, it defies political sense. I believe that there are other arguments that would have been more persuasive. The people of this country will decide if the Prime Minister has chosen not to speak, whether that was right or that was wrong, is for the people to decide. And you have to take that case to the people. You don't bring a no-confidence which is doomed to fail in any case. At the threshold you know your no-confidence is doomed to fail. You don't bring it needlessly and waste the time of the House. You don't disrupt the house needlessly when you know that the ruling party likes nothing better than the house being disrupted so that bills can be passed in the din. So ministers are happy not to answer any questions in question hour. This is, for every ruling party, this is a dream scenario. They let the opposition disrupt parliament so that we can go home and sleep happily. So therefore, this kind of disruptive politics has not paid dividend in the past and I have no doubt that this kind of disruptive politics will not pay dividend in the future. As far as Manipur is concerned, I have to say that the Honorable uh, Home Minister had called an all-party meeting. I was one of the members who was present there on behalf, behalf of my party. It was an exceptionally detailed analysis which was given to everybody. The Congress party was represented there by Shri Ibobi Singh, who was their three-term former Chief Minister. All the other parties were there and we were given a complete kaleidoscope really of what has gone wrong in Manipur. And these are legacy issues. Manipur is not the result, this today's conflagration in Manipur is not the result of the last 10 years, let's face it. It's the result of almost 50 to 60 years of strife in Manipur. The fact of the matter is that this entire issue has boiled over, not now, it has boiled over three or four times in a major way through the 80s and the 90s. <clears throat> this was somehow capped until, very unfortunately, the Manipur High Court in a PIL suddenly woke up one fine morning in a 20-minute hearing without pleadings being completed. The High Court passed what, according to me, is one of the most ill-advised orders that this country has ever seen of giving a direction to the state government to immediately consider within four weeks the giving of ST status to, the, to a particular community. 
firstly, this is totally without jurisdiction because the state government can't do it. It's something only the central government can do. So the High Court not only passed a totally erroneous order, but passed an order without hearing all the parties, without affidavits being completed, without any kind of rationale or logic. It simply passed an order which the Supreme Court severely deprecated. The Honorable the Chief Justice's court in, on 19th of May severely de deprecated the High Court order. But I believe the central government missed a trick there. I believe the central government in asking for the matter to be remanded back to the High Court to be heard there was a huge error. And I pointed this out at the meeting, that the central government should have been happy to let the matter rest in the Supreme Court's lap. Because we have seen that the people of this country have great faith in the Supreme Court. Look at the classic case of Babri Masjid, Ram Janamuhumi dispute. For decades, this dispute could not be resolved until the Supreme Court sat down, gave a judgment, and both parties accepted it graciously. So I believe that if this issue had been left to the Supreme Court, tempers would have cooled. Instead, the matter went back to the High Court, and the High Court, again, in a totally ill-advised order, instead of cancelling the last order, simply revised the order and said, all right, instead of four weeks, you take one year to decide this matter. Which means the sword of Democles, therefore, kept hanging, and this is what has constantly created the kind of fiction that we have seen. Mr. Chairman, I have to say that the, what has happened in Manipur today is, as Mr. Patnaik says, heart-rending. And he has asked me to, in fact, mention in the all-party meeting and to speak today and say that all parties must speak in one voice. What this parliament cannot afford is a no-confidence motion against the central government because every political party must give their constructive suggestion at the moment to say what is possible, what can be done, because you are really trying to fit a square peg in a round hole there. That's the problem today. So therefore, you have to give constructive suggestions rather than blaming the central government for what is clearly a legacy issue running back several decades. There is no question that blame has to be apportioned to the state government. Every right-thinking person has said so. Every right-thinking person has said that the chief minister ought to have conducted his politics and his policies on the basis of Raj Dharma, which perhaps has been lacking there. There is no doubt about it. But I don't know whether the central government would have been better advised to have brought in President's rule, because clearly there was no alternative to this chief minister. Therefore, if the President's rule had to be imposed there, I'm not sure that that in this country has ever worked satisfactorily in other states as well. So it is really a Hobson's choice and that the central government was confronted with. And that is something that I think all political parties honestly should have considered and should have felt, therefore, that the need of the hour is to speak in one voice and not to speak in a fractious tone. And I, I'm going to conclude in a short while. The, the heart-rending scenes that we have seen with regard to the atrocities on women in Manipur is, is not new to us. This is seen everywhere in the world where there is strife, where there is this kind of conflict, where there is this sort of internecine warfare. We have seen this in sub-Saharan Africa, African nations, in Burundi, between the, Hut the Hutus and the Tutsis. We've seen this in Rwanda, for instance. We've seen this in Bosnia, Herzegovina. We've seen this in uh, uh, Serbia. So this is endemic, unfortunately, to, the, to, the, to, to our society and our polity. And therefore, I come to this one seminal issue that the way to way forward for women's empowerment is again what Mr. Naveen Patnaik has been repeatedly requesting the central government to bring in the women's reservation bill. And I think that is one area where the central government will be seriously remiss if in the 17th Lok Sabha they don't do it because there is a full majority. In fact, there is near unanimity. The, today, all shades of political opinion in this house and the upper house are of the same opinion that there should be women's reservation in the state assemblies as well as in central parliament. Because that is the kind of empowerment we need for women on the ground level, at the cutting edge level, at the grassroots level, to feel empowered, to feel that they have an equal stake in society, and for men to therefore feel that, look, they are now our equals, they are in a, as powerful position as we are, so therefore we should treat them 
at par. So, Mr. Chairman, this is something that I would seriously on this occasion, if there is anything on which I feel that this government, I think, lacks the confidence of this House, quite frankly, is that they have not brought, despite being fully empowered to do so, the Women's Reservation Bill so far. We have now only one more session of Parliament after this, which is the winter session. I certainly plead and urge the Prime Minister that he should bring in the Women's Reservation Bill, have it passed unanimously. It can be done in 15 minutes in the lower house and the upper house. Parliamentary Affairs Minister is here. I have requested him personally many times also. But that, they are saying that it is lapsed now. Because okay. I know it should not. That's, I don't know. I was told. But in any case, so that is one of the things that we, we need to seriously consider. Now, therefore, for a number of compelling reasons that I have, I have mentioned, we are completely, completely unable to uh, persuade ourselves on behalf of the okay. Biju Jantadal and Mr. Naveen Patnaik to support this no confidence motion. I have no doubt that it will be resoundingly defeated and it will be rejected as it ought to. And uh, unfortunately, I think it will not at all benefit the Congress party to have brought this no confidence at this Shri point. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.